Hi everybody, this is Enzo and I'm just halfway through, I'm going to do something different here. I'm just halfway through recording the audiobook for Get The Drive. Well actually I've recorded it, I'm just editing it. But as I was doing it, I thought, you know what, this content I should just put out for free. A little bit of this book just to give somebody some kind of nugget of information that might help them for next year on sponsorship. So drivers looking for sponsorship this is. So I picked a track and I'm going to play it now. So hopefully this will be of interest to you and help you find sponsorship for 2020. Enjoy. Rule number two, this is business. As a driver or someone who wants to become a professional driver, you will have already fallen in love with motorsport and the idea of becoming a champion. This is easily done because motorsport is heroic. It embodies passion, danger, and it lures you in, making you believe that it's your calling. Once this sport gets its claws into you, it really takes hold of your focus and life. It becomes all you think of and care about. In your mind, you see it as a Hollywood storyline where you are the hero who is chasing their dream and doing all they can to fight their way forward. This is why you're listening to this book and putting in the extra work to learn about sponsorship. I love the fact that you've done that and I congratulated you earlier and I do now again and I always will for falling in love with this sport because I also share that love. When you care about something this much, it fuels you. It gets you up in the morning. It fills your days and keeps you up at night. It forces you to train, to work on every aspect of yourself and constantly move forward. You get addicted to this. As a human being, it hits all of your inner values. I applaud you for having something in life like this because most people don't. They don't have this desire. So again, a big high five to you for that. In the early years when I started racing, I also shared this mindset. This was great for my motivation and it was also the, my biggest downfall at the same time. It was a curse because it clouded this passion of the Hollywood storyline. It clouded the true picture of what I was entering into. I mean, I was young, in my late teens or early 20s, but it wasn't my main problem I had. My main problem was the fact that I wasn't switched on business-wise. I didn't have a clue. I thought that just by putting a sticker on the side of a car and offering some hospitality, that's all I needed to do in order to get sponsors. I stupidly thought that that was enough. I let the romance of the sport completely hypnotize me. It made me believe that if I race and do well and win, then the reward for that, I'll be granted some kind of chance or promotion through the sport just by winning. I thought that results actually did that. I mean, obviously they can get results, can open doors, but it's not an automatic thing. Many people have won championships and got nothing from it. And you often find the people that do get results and do get a chance had other things going on in the background. It wasn't just the results. So please remember that results alone are not enough. When I won a championship, I expected the phone to ring to, for, from teams or sponsors or whoever just to give me a chance. But it didn't make a real difference. Okay, it made a few things a little bit easier because the sales pitch now I could say British champion, but not in terms of getting cash together for racing. It didn't really impact that at all. The reason for this is that people are just too busy to care about your nice looking trophy or your story. They've got their own lives and companies to run, so it doesn't really impact them at all. I quickly learned after this that I must create, if I want to get ahead, I must create huge value to other people's lives in order to get them to invest in my racing. Results were nice, but they're not even close to what they needed. So then I came to a bitter realization of how motorsport really works. I want to open your eyes to the fact that motorsport is more business than it is a sport. If you do not translate your racing into business terms, then you will end up as another wannabe racing driver watching from the sidelines. During the research period of this book, I spoke to Eric Bullier, uh, who at the time was the head of the McLaren F1 team. He said that Formula One and what you see on TV is all one big mirage. Outsiders, you know, spectators and people like that watching on TV, they see the sport. But as soon as you work within it, you see that it is a business disguised as a sport. He said this as he was pointing to all of his guests at the Abu Dhabi race. And he actually said to me, 
all these people in our hospitality right now are here for one reason. And that reason is business. They don't really care about the actual race that's going on. When he said that, it was something like, yeah, I know this already, but actually seeing it and understanding it and then knowing why each person was there and why they were there, it really opened my eyes. Formula One offers very poor return on investment for companies, let's be honest. They pay millions of dollars to get their small logo put on the car. But do you think that this one logo will be seen by anyone? Do you really think it will create millions of dollars of extra income for that company just because they put a sticker on the car? Not at all. At least not if it was advertising only. There has to be much more behind the scenes and other benefits to really make it worth their time. That's when we get into business and the mutual back scratching partnerships that motorsport's pretty much made of, especially the higher you go up. If you want to succeed in motorsport, you have to start to play the business game sooner rather than later. That means now. Business drivers. You will be able to name quite a few drivers in F1 and other top line championships who are clearly not good enough to be there. Yet, they are on the grid year after year. Why do you think that is? It's because the overall value they provide outweighs their lack of speed. A team will look at that particular driver or driver like that and say, so what if they're 0.3 of a second a lap slower than their teammate? They're bringing a multi-million dollar deal to the team. We need that multi-million dollar deal in order to survive. So that driver gets the seat over someone who's a bit quicker. Even though that driver's slower, they're keeping the team alive and they're helping pay the bills, plus other benefits that might not be on paper. If you understand this side of things, not just in motorsport, but in life, then you will go far. I'm not saying that this is correct and the way it should be, but it's just the way it works. If you want help from others, then you need to provide them with value. Simple. Destroyed dreams. This realization that I've just said destroys the dream a bit, doesn't it? Particularly when you start to see the strings behind the puppet show. Let's just say it that way. It's like finding out that Santa Claus is not real. But come on. This audiobook is about how things really work. Remember, we're building a matrix of what's really going on out there. So we've got to see it for what it is. If you really want to see this through, it's time to lift your head out of the clouds and play the real game that will help you do this. The business game. If you truly want to get that drive, it's time to put aside your emotions and stick your logical head on to ask different types of questions from now on. Questions like, how can I bring something to the party on the business side? Something that as a side benefit gets me in the car. This is how I want you to see your racing from now on. I mean, most of us regard Ayrton Senna as being one of the greatest drivers ever. But all we focus on is his driving, the driving itself and the way he was, his character. What we overlook is how good he was at business. He was so switched on and so good at getting himself in the right car at the right time that it helped him become even more successful. This wasn't down to sheer luck or results. It was down to his understanding of the corporate world and more importantly, how to negotiate. And when Sir Frank Williams was once asked for his opinion on Senna, he said, my abiding memory of Ayrton is not the world-class ability as a race driver, but as an intellectually unbeatable businessman. He was gifted with a propensity for extraordinary clear thinking and outstanding ability to outguess, outthink and outmaneuver his business opponent. Now, just how many F1 team bosses do you hear saying that about a race driver? From a young age, Senna knew the importance of business. He used to work on a market stall at home, and early on, he even went to business school. It didn't last long, but he still went. Another racing driver turned business driver is Bernie Eccleston. It is well known just how clever he was in business and how he rose to become the king of F1. This guy couldn't go to sleep at night if he hadn't done a deal in that day. This mentality and skill set took him from being a second-hand car salesman to a billionaire powerhouse. Other champions. Jump into other sports for a moment. Let's just take a look at the great Muhammad Ali. He knew all too well, too well how to generate income and how to create a business buzz. He took himself from being this quiet young boxer to the megastar known all over the world. 
Ali's fast track to learning the business of boxing was when he saw a wrestling match with Gorgeous George in it. Gorgeous George was known for his loud mouth and funny antics during matches. He knew how to act and promote himself, and in turn he would pack out stadiums. This was good for business for all involved, right? George's forte was for being overly obnoxious and creating a media buzz so people used to go and watch him to lose. Or win, best of both worlds. Ali saw this and was immediately inspired to do the same. So the big mouth and entertaining Ali was born. He found a voice that made him marketable and he broke into the business world that way. These guys are not stupid. They're intelligent human beings and they know how to influence people in the worlds beyond their own sport. They become more than just a sports person, don't they? And in doing that, they're a business person. As another example of sportsman to businessman, how about Arnold Schwarzenegger? Seven-time Mr. Olympia, Hollywood superstar and former governor of California itself. When Arnold was a bodybuilder, he couldn't really earn much money through the sport itself. Even winning Mr. Olympia title would only leave him $1,000 richer. Can you imagine that? It's different nowadays, obviously. Yet before he became a Hollywood movie star, he earned his way to becoming a millionaire already. He was in a sport that didn't pay much yet still managed to become a millionaire. How did he do that? You guessed it, he was good at business. He made his first million dollars through property investment. Arnold would be managing that company at the same time as training six hours a day in the gym. Plus, he was running personal training sessions. He was also attending language school. And on top of all this, he was publishing his own bodybuilding books and selling them. Wow. Yeah, wow indeed. You thought you were busy with your racing. This crazy dude was hammering each waking hour whilst on the pursuit to achieving what we see now. Arnold was just a kid from Austria, a small town in Austria, born the year after the Second World War in a country that was in ruins and on rations and they lived in fear of the next attack from Russia. He grew up with Russian tanks passing his house on a daily basis and living under strict rules. Yet he still managed to create one of the most impressive and versatile careers ever pulled off by an individual. How many people from a distant little town have made it to America, have gone on to become Mr. Olympia seven times, next become the highest paid Hollywood star, then on to governor of an entire American state? This is more than someone who can just lift weights. This is someone who fully understood business. Oh, and someone who understood hard work. That's the psychology side of it. While we're here, let's just grab another handful of examples. Venus Williams, multiple tennis Grand Slam winner. She's also CEO of many companies. One of them is a clothing company called Eleven and another an interior design business called V-Star Interiors. Still in the same sport, Maria Sharpova, she has a confectionery company selling more than 2 million bags of candy in its first year. There's a trend here. Let's keep going. Magic Johnson was a boss basketball hero with a business vision. His business would help rebuild the neighborhoods around Chicago. Then into boxing again, there's George Foreman, the former heavyweight champion of the world. He was reportedly earned $2 million from George Foreman Grills. He wasn't just endorsing the grills. He actually nurtured that deal over the years. The list of business-minded megastars goes on. People like Dr. Dre, Conor McGregor, Lewis Hamilton, Oprah Winfrey, Jessica Alba, Justin Timberlake, Ashton Kutcher, Will Smith, George Clooney, and good old Paul Newman, who was actually a championship-winning race driver himself. All of these people had a certain craft that they fell in love with as youngsters, but along the way, they saw the importance of business and how it related to their career. Bills and dreams. It was slightly different for many of the people above because they added business to their career. But for you, business is a must. It's a must because you need to get good at it before you can even compete in the first place. That means it is even more important for you. Everybody in motorsport, you, the teams, the suppliers, the championship organizers, the sponsors and the circuits are only in motorsport for one of two reasons. They either want to pay their bills or they want to achieve their dreams. 
They actually want both, but one more than the other. Race teams have to pay for their cars. They have to pay their suppliers, their staff, workshop rates, overheads, cleaners, etc. Everybody needs to be paid in a race team so a team may have dreams of winning the title, but before that can happen, they need to pay their bills. Hence why they need drivers to pay their budgets to run the car. If they are supported by a big sponsor or manufacturer, then they focus more on their dreams. But until that happens, bills for a race team are a priority. As for drivers, you have a simple job to do if you want to join a team. You must supply one of these two reasons for them, one of them two motivators, the bills or dreams. First, you have to determine what's more important to that particular team that you're approaching, that you're speaking to. Are they interested in paying their bills or reaching their dreams? That's what you've got to find out first. Once you know the answer to this, it's your job to provide that for them. This goes for every single person you're involved with, whether it's a sponsor, a team, a coach, or even a manager. If they want to pay the bills, then you must supply them with that money. If they want to achieve their dreams, then you need to be the person that helps them do that. In return, you get what you want from them. That's business in its simplest format, right? As soon as you pay for your race license, you have already paid into the system. You've helped somebody somewhere. Whether it's a championship organizer or a governing body, you've helped them towards achieving their goal, bills or dreams. You are the same. You want both. You want someone to pay your bills and or help achieve your dreams. So this is one big circle. Always remember bills and dreams. Keep this to the forefront of your mind when you're talking to someone. If you need to create value, it's either they want the cash or they want some kind of mission to be accomplished and you've got to figure out how to help them. Then in return, you get yours.